stranger to people here. He's been here several times before. He's here part of the financial advisory board. And right after this, I think he's going to the airport back to Stuttgart, where he is now on the faculty in, the, in physics in this institute. Gentleman is a, a really an innovator for those of us who know him. He was the first to realize the dipolar BC, which is now, of course, the dipolar gases. Um, sort of uh, magnetic dipolar gases are much in fashion. He, in fact, is, has a lab working on uh, dysprosium, which you may describe someday or not, but no, we won't. But, <laughs> He did the first PEC with chromium, which was not, of course, the, the, the right atom to form uh, condensate, but he was able to do it. And was, in fact, the first one to be able to uh, image the, the mechanical effect of the dipole-dipole interaction on the aspect ratio of the PEC. Uh, he moved on to, which I think would be most of what he will describe, or these, these uh, micro traps, uh, these um, gas, you know, thermal gas vapors, where we again also demonstrated the uh, Ritter correlation is, uh, even at, at, at uh, high temperatures, which we will describe more in detail today. And he was also again the first one to be able to realize these Ritter molecules, which uh, sort of created the sort of cottage industry. Uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the thermal gas, and then later also in, in the EC, where he saw the effects of dimer, trimer, and tetramer, and, and so on, formation. Um, he uh, is, uh, or was, very much interested in the, uh, teaching in high school, curriculum uh, reformulation, I think, I don't know why, but I can explain to you why. Um, he was on, he's on the faculty senate at the University of Stuttgart, an APS fellow, and very recently he won the APS Broido Prize in atomic and chemical physics. So, without much further ado, John, please. Thank you, Hussein. It's a pleasure to be back and uh, an honor to speak here uh, again in the colloquium. Uh, some of you might remember that uh, about two years ago, I already gave a talk here in this Dalgado uh, lecture series. And one of these uh, lecture series was also in thermal vapor cells. And what I'm going to do today is to give you an update on that story. And uh, then I have some bonus material on uh, ultra-cold uh, rigbar gases and what you can do with them, um, in particular how to make ions from a, a condensate ultra-cold ions and how they interact uh, with these uh, gases. All right, so um, as uh, Hussein was already saying, in my group we have these three different research activities, dipolar gases. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I mean, so many people start this, including I, I hear now there's a BEC here of erbium. So, you know, if, if uh, so famous people like Markus and Wolfgang, I mean, they all jump into this then it's time to do something else. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have this other activity on, on cold Rydberg gases. I will comment on this a little bit. But what uh, I will focus on today is this work at room temperature or above and try to see whether some of the quantum phenomena that we see at uh, ultra cold atoms actually survives at ambient conditions. Finally, may, maybe be the basis for some real devices in the end. Um, so you know that uh, atomic vapors, of course, have a long history in making devices. For magnetometry, for example, here you see me uh, several years ago in uh, uh, Wisconsin um, in front of a vapor cell. And this little vapor cell here is measuring my heartbeat. So it measures the magnetic field due to the current uh, of my blood, basically, in my heart, so look at the details of this signal, <coughs> uh, but what you can see is 
that these small magnetic fields can be uh, detected directly by a vapor cell. Um, and the big stuff around here is just the end of a cryostate of a reference measurement that people would do with a squid. And so you see that you know, the dimension of this squid due to the cryostate is huge, and the vapor cell is just as small as this. And of course, you know that this technology is now a commercial one. I mean, you go to Q-spin here in, in, in Boulder, uh, Sonja Knappe at NIST has sort of perfected this, and you can buy a helmet and measure uh, basically dozens of uh, points yes, of uh, the magnetic field around of your brain, for example. So magnetometry, that's a, that's a commercial uh, business at the moment uh, based on uh, vapor cells. Of course, atomic clocks, you can also buy them. Yes? Also due to the development at NIST uh, in, in, in Boulder, you have these very small little uh, cesium cells which serve as a, as a reference uh, a clock, basically, uh, as a representation of the definition of our second, and that's a chip that you can buy, so it's a, it's a business. Um, of course, you know that vapor cells are used to store quantum information, because, you know, you get optical thickness, and you can uh, store single photons, retrieve them um, in there, uh, for example, in warm but many people, including people here, are doing this. Another application is microwave sensing, I'm going in one more slide, a little bit into this, because we got this started uh, several years ago when Jim Schaefer was a uh, Humboldt fellow, actually, during his uh, sabbatical in our labs. Um, the principle of this microwave sensing is very simple. You just measure the outer town splitting, so the electric field of the microwave interacting with the dipole of a Rydberg atom. And this dipole is huge, so the uh, outer town splitting is huge for small fields. Um, it uses a Rydberg transition that is in the uh, 50 to 50 gigahertz to a terahertz region, so you can span the whole interesting high frequency um, uh, range there. And uh, based on this measurement, uh, and that's why I'm mentioning this, again, there is a spin off company now, actually, this is uh, in, uh, in uh, Ann Arbor uh, called Rydberg, that is developing this kind of sensor. And Jim Schaefer, who was the uh, uh, lead author here, the senior uh, author of this first publication that we have on this, now made a uh, change from Oklahoma to this Quantum Ideas Valley Lab in, in, in Waterloo to develop exactly this uh, principle to a real commercial um, device that measures high frequency microwaves in a calibrated way. That's the thing, because this dipole moment here, because it's the dipole moment of Rydberg states, can be calculated from first principles. So there is nothing to calibrate. It's sort of self-calibrated. It only contains natural constants. So once you measure this outer town splitting, you know what is your electric field of this microwave. Uh, so these first uh, measurements were like on the microvolt per centimeter per, per root hertz, but by now it's about a factor of 10 better or so. And this depends on the frequency where you work at and so on. Um, okay. But it's a little vapor cell, and you just do two photon spectroscopy in the optical domain and shine some uh, microwave. It's a very simple setup. I mean, in okay, so um, these vapor cells that, uh, uh, that can, can be made in various uh, ways. Um, over the years, you know, in our efforts to, to, to mimic sort of what is going on in our ultra cold Rydberg experiments, we have uh, learned how to make cells that have electrical feed-throughs to control the electric fields, because if you work with Rydberg atoms, you want to be able to uh, control static electric fields. Uh, we have learned how to uh, implement electronic structures, even on the inside of these vapor cells, to uh, bring, for example, low-noise amplifiers very close to the source of the current that is produced. We have learned how to make uh, uh, etched structures in glass, so we can make uh, vapor cells of any shape on the micrometer scale using just conventional uh, lithography techniques. And we have also learned how to make, how to fill basically all kinds of hollow fibers, photonic crystal or carbomer fibers with rubidium and do Rydberg spectroscopy inside those cells. So that's a little technical, but sort of you can see, you know, that. Uh, um, uh, the, the vapor cells are ready for technology, yes? And uh, basically what we are benefiting from is, I mean, all the 
knowledge that is piling up now in nanophotonics as well, where uh, you know uh, you can uh, write photonic waveguide structures and all kinds of optical circuits on a on a chip. And one of our projects was to basically try to use these integrated photonics uh, structures to interface with hot atoms in a vapor cell. Okay, that's going to be a short first part of my talk, and then I move on to a uh, single photon source that we realized in a very thin uh, vapor cell using the Rydberg uh, blockade at room temperature, actually above room temperature. Um, I might then uh, continue with another more technical, and you see it's going to be a quite technical talk, uh, uh, application um, about uh, how to detect very small concentrations of trace gases using the resonant enhancement of this multi-photon Rydberg excitation. And if I have time, and I hope I have, you should warn me, let's say 10 minutes before we uh, stop, I will add something ultra cold just to, you know, uh, relieve you uh, uh, from all this technology stuff here. Okay, so what's the benefit of these uh, uh, photonic structures? Well, you write a structure on a chip like this that has input ports, output ports, it has beam splitters, interferometers, resonators, everything built in. And once it's written, you don't need to adjust it anymore, and it is a very small um, object. Okay? And the first thing that we try to do is, can we use this for uh, spectroscopic um, applications? Okay? And the idea is, you have this chip, you couple in by so-called Bragg couplers, that means you shine in the light from the bottom, then Bragg uh, diffraction basically scatters the light into the waveguide, it does what it has to do in the circuit, and comes back out on the other side with another Bragg coupler, and you observe the light is coming out on the other end. Okay. Um, you can control the contact of the vapor on the top of this structure now by covering the waveguide structure at places where you don't want the atoms to interact just by normal glass, basically, yeah, silicon dioxide. And wherever you want to have interaction, you just leave it open. And then, basically, atoms make their way to the evanescent field, and they interact with the light that is propagating here. In this example, it's an interferometer. On the one arm, we have the, inter we have the interaction with the thermal vapor. On the other, it's just a reference arm that is fully covered by glass. That will be just a, 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 a reference here. Okay. So this is how such a cell actually looks like. And if you look into these structures, you see that a single cell does not only contain one of these setups, it contains hundreds of them, okay? And if you look into those structures, I don't know, the beamer doesn't show it very well, but you see there are interferometers, ring resonators, transmission lines, all kinds of circuits that you can dream of, all in a single cell. And you just point your laser here, then you do transmission experiment. You point it here, you have a longer transmission line, actually that's a three-port device. You point it here, then there's a whole array of ring resonators, and so on. There's a question in the back. To make sure I understand. So atoms are flying everywhere? Atoms are flying everywhere on the surface. So, so this structure is on the inside of this vapor cell. And whenever this structure is open, like here, atoms are just in the evanescent field. They have a transient time, of course, and that leads to a broadening. But other than that, it's just rubidium atoms or cesium atoms that are interacting so with what is the fluctuation in the number of atoms next to uh, so, um, yeah, that's a very good point. So how many atoms do we have? Depends on the volume, of course. All the experiments that I'm going to show you are on the classical side, at least these first ones. But it's a very interesting point whether we can use this to, in a transient way, detect a single atom. We have not done it, but uh, that's one of the things that uh, is on our agenda. Whether we can make a cavity and we just see a single thermal atom flying through uh, a whole of this... Uh, uh, I guess my question was different it's because you are not always you don't always have the same number of atoms. So as a result, your system is fluctuating. Yeah, there is an intrinsic thermal fluctuation on the time scale of the transient, basically, um, and that is on the order of several nanoseconds. Yes, that's true. Okay, so um, and this is just a summary of things that we have done. And if you are interested, there are a bunch of uh, uh, references. About some of these experiments, I actually already reported two years ago, so I just have this uh, to remind you here. Um, here, for example, there is a, a two-photon spectroscopy, 
I mean, we have a 780 and 776 laser counter propagating in the open region, and we get rid of the Doppler effect basically, and all that is remaining is the transient broadening, and you see this is an asymmetric line, the surface interaction. So these atoms interact with the uh, surface here, and that gives uh, rise to a little asymmetric line profile to the red because the uh, interaction with the surface is actually attractive. Here we have an interferometer with a long arm, and the reference here, if we do an, inter an experiment here, we do not see the linear absorption, basically, we just see the dispersion of the um, rubidium vapor in that case as a phase shift um, uh, that depends, of course, on the density that you put in here. Here you see uh, data on the ring resonator. You can see actually the atoms are fluorescing once you hit the resonance. And in, in this picture, it's a real picture, basically taken with a camera and colored later on. Um, it's fluorescence at 780 nanometer. You see that we have a resonance at the same time of the atoms and the, resonate, and the ring, basically. Yes? Otherwise, the light will not couple into the ring. So that big thing is the ring resonance resonance of the ring resonator and this small structure basically is the uh, response of the atomic medium. Okay. Another platform that we actually recently started to work on is in the telecom band, basically 1.5 micrometer, because rubidium has a transition there. Okay. And the lifetime in this state, in the P state, is actually longer than the transient time in the evanescent field. So if we pump this system up with a 780 nanometer it's just as uh, if these atoms would be ground state atoms. And then do, you do all the spectroscopy, nonlinear optics, whatever you uh, have at the telecom wavelengths at 1.5 microns. And that then requires silicon photonics, where there is, of course, a lot of nanotechnology um, available. All the other structures here were silicon nitride structures that were directly transparent at the 780 nanometer of the uh, rubidium uh, ground state transition here. OK. So this is just, uh, you know, some technology development that we did over the years and will be the basis for future integration. And now the question is, I mean, this was all classical spectroscopy, basically. Can we do something quantum, let's say? And um, the, the, that involves Rydberg atoms, strongly interacting Rydberg atoms. And I don't know, I mean, I don't have to tell you what the Rydberg rocket is, right? And or what Rydberg atoms are. I, I guess you have heard this so many times that I skip over this. The important part is the, here, the interaction scales with the principal quantum number to the 11th power. It makes the interaction between two Rydberg atoms so strong. Right? And the question is, is it even strong enough to lead to quantum effects at room temperature or above? And the answer, and that's what I'm going to show you, is yes, it's strong enough. So for example, if you look at this 35S state, interaction energy at one micrometer um, is on the order of a gigahertz or something, and that is um, comparable to the Doppler width. So that's what you need. You need to overcome the line broadening of your spectroscopy signal by the interaction. Then you are in the strongly interacting machine. Or in other words, I mean, you have seen this plot probably many times yeah, when you compare the Rydberg Rydberg interaction on an extreme log scale that is taken from Mark Safman's paper with, uh, for example, light-induced dipole-dipole interaction or magnetic dipole-dipole interaction like in erbium, chromium, dysprosium, and so on. And you see that the only real stronger interaction is the direct Coulomb interaction, but there you have no control. You can't switch you know, from a neutral to an ion and back. So that's uh, why basically the best candidate for these strong interactions, at least if you really want to have large absolute values of interaction energies is Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. So uh, this is the, my, my Rydberg rocket slide since many years. And so what it means is that you have two ground state atoms sitting at a certain distance. You excite one of them to the Rydberg state. Nothing happens, but something happens. There are trilobites and so on. But on this scale, it's not important at all. Um, then if you excite the second one to the Rydberg state, there is a strong, in this case, repulsive van der Waals interaction. And if this is larger than the bandwidth of your excitation, and in our case that's going to be Doppler, uh, uh, the Doppler width, then um, the excitations have to keep the distance, the so-called blockade radius. Okay. Um, that works for cold atoms, but shouldn't it also work for, uh, for, for vapor cells? And the, the answer is, um, yes, it should actually also work. 
if I make a volume, if I define a volume smaller than the blockade radius. And for, let's say, a 40S atom at the Doppler width that we are talking about, the blockade radius is on the order of one micrometer. So this means we have to make a vapor cell that has a dimension of one micrometer. Okay. Then if we uh, uh, excite it, basically, the, uh, with a typical two-photon excitation to the red red state, due to this blockade effect, there can only be a single excitation in this vapor cell, although there are thousands of atoms present. But um, this is uh, um, not just a, a statistical mixture of excitations, basically. If you do it fast enough, then the first uh, thing that will happen, and that is, of course, uh, uh, going back to Michal Lukin's paper, famous paper in 2001, um, we will form what we call a superatom, namely that this excitation is shared in a coherent fashion between all members of this ensemble, let's say a thousand. Yes? If you introduce these walls for each uh, atom, could you change the electronic state of the atom? Little bit because boundary conditions are very fast. Uh, okay, and this thing is blocks. still, I, I, I can comment on the surface interaction maybe later. Certainly, the Rittberg atoms that we are going to use here are much smaller than the one micrometer size. They are about 100 nanometers in size. Okay, so if they, of course, interact with the wall, then uh, sort of we are dead. And we can, we can discuss this maybe later, um, why we are actually not seeing this here. Um, uh, because we are lucky, but I can comment on this uh, uh, later. Um, but for now, assume that this Rittberg atom is much smaller than one micrometer and it doesn't hit the wall. Okay. Then this collective excitation here, you know, it's a quantum mechanical superposition of all possible configurations with a single excitation. And the important thing is this, this superposition state has, has, let's say, pluses here, yes? So it's making a symmetric combination. So you might ask, um, what if the atoms move, you know? Don't they lose the phase relation. All these uh, states, you know, correspond to different atoms, to different configurations. And indeed, um, if we wait too long in a, in, a, in a room temperature ensemble, then we will develop phases here, e to the ik, uh, uh, kb, basically, or uh, e to the ikz in the, in the uh, plane wave. Um, and we will very quickly lose the coherence of that state. So what is the secret? Well, we just have to be faster than that. It just means we have to do this excitation from the ground state to this collective excited state faster than the atoms move. And what is the relevant time scale or energy scale? It's again the Doppler width. Okay. So Doppler width is on the order of 100 megahertz or something, so we have to work on the nanosecond time scale. If we work on the nanosecond time scale, we can expect this state to survive even at room temperature. Okay. Now, how do we prove that this is the case? Well, we, we, we build a single photon source based on this single excitation. By <coughs> converting this single excitation that lives up here back down to a single photon in a, in a four-back mixing process. That was, of course, already proposed uh, one year after the superatom paper by Sefman and Walker, 2002. Yes? How to use the Rittberg blockade, basically, um, um, uh, to, to make single photon sources on demand. Okay. So, making such a little vapor cell, combining it with a four-wave mixing scheme, should lead to a, a, a single photon. Okay. And that's, that's the experiment that we are going to do. So, this experiment has been done already for ultra-code atoms, years, uh, five years ago, six years ago by now, by the, by Alex Kuzmi. And so what he did is he took a dipole trap, trapped an ensemble of atoms, few thousand atoms. As this was a cold experiment for um, his principal quantum numbers between 40 and 100, the blockade radius was actually 10 or 20 micrometers, very large, yes? So it was easy, well, I, I, I mean, it was, it was possible for him to show that the G2 correlation function of the single photon or the, the light that comes out basically goes all the way down to zero if you increase the Rydberg Rydberg interaction by just making the Rydberg atoms bigger and bigger. So at the Rydberg principal quantum number of 100, this is a perfect 
single photon source where the single photons come out on demand whenever you apply this uh, four-wave mixing scheme. And we set out, actually already uh, years before that, to try to do this um, at room temperature. Now, um, the state that we are going to use is the 40S state. And here you see the interaction potential, which is nice and clean. That's why I'm showing it to you for two rubidium atoms. Actually, this choice is not trivial here. Yes? Uh, uh, for example, in the cesium case, this looks like a, a lot of spaghetti here. You would not see a nice Wittberg brocade all the way up to the gigahertz uh, range. But here you should see that this is in gigahertz. So even, let's say, 5 gigahertz yeah, at, at a distance of 1 mic uh, micrometer, you, you have a strong interaction that is clean, no cro crossings and so on. Yes. Then, what we did, uh, okay, now we have to compare this to the Doppler width. That's about the Doppler width. And you see, okay, the blockade radius is going to be 1.1 micrometer for this uh, pair potential. Then we set out to make a thin vapor cell. And I actually brought one with me. Believe it or not, I got it through the customs. So I can pass it around. So this is a box. And what you see here is one of these vapor cells. It's a, a I should say, don't break it. <laughs> you don't use this particular one anymore, but there is rubidium here in the back. And if you break the rubidium and you spill it over there. <laughs> So what you see here is... is, is, is the uh, theorists out there really don't break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's why I brought this box. Maybe you just look at it like this, yeah. you know, you don't take it in your hand. Or something. But what you see here, if you look closer, uh, and you uh, look against some light source, are Newton rings, okay, like shown here on this picture. That's what you are supposed to see here, okay? There's a touching point in the middle. It looks a little dirty, and if you run, look around that, then you see uh, Newton rings. And so I'm passing it around and hope I can bring it back through customs <coughs> unbroken again. <laughs> so that's the kind of cell that we made and that we are using for this purpose now. And in addition, we just focus a laser beam of this four-wave mixing into this little vapor cell such that the total volume is one cubic micrometer or less. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if you, I should say, if you see these Newton rings, then this means this vapor cell is one micrometer thick, more or less. Yeah, it's an optical wavelength. And actually, these are the rings we can use to determine the thickness very accurately. Okay, so um, let's do it. Yeah. So uh, here you see the four wave mixing cycle. Um, and that's the setup. It's actually a wedge cell. You see that there are Newton rings. So if you just move this cell back and forth, you're changing the distance between the two glass balls. Okay. Uh, so the setup is very simple. Huh? We have these uh, laser beams, three laser beams that are going into the cell. They are focused very tightly. And we go up the D2 line, uh, sorry, the D1 line at 795. It's hard to see here, sorry. Um, and come back to the D2 line. That, the reason for that is that later on we have to filter out all these billions of photons because we are going to use a single photon detector right in the same direction. Okay, so we have 795 and 780, and we have good enough filters that we have basically zero background here, although we have all these pulses. Um, then what we see is um, uh, a coherent signal in the forward direction, as we should get in the forward wave mixing, and the time scale here is nanoseconds. So let's say over one or two nanoseconds, we get an emission peak. That tells you already. I mean, that's much shorter than the lifetime in this P-state. That tells you already four-wave mixing is sort of working. Yes? It's sort of a, um, a forward-directed uh, collective emission, not just spontaneous emission, as you might uh, uh, see, see if there would be no phase relationship here. Okay. Um, and then if you measure the G2 of this light that comes out, you actually see that the, uh, uh, the, the G2 for um, a time span of a few nanoseconds comes down to 0.2, not to zero, so it's not perfect, but to 0.2, which is significantly <coughs> below one. And so this is, in that sense, a proof of concept that actually this Rydberg blockade, this uh, uh, W state with its phase uh, relation, and its conversion back into the photon field actually works. Okay. Now you can do some systematic uh, measurements here. 
For example, you just sell thicker than, let's say, 1.2 or 1.3 micrometers, then the effect is gone. That's a G2. There's a reference measurement just to make sure that we have the right north. The G2 should be 1, yeah, if you just have normal laser light coming. Um, but here you see the blue points basically tell you it's, it's, it's sort of a measurement of this blockade radius, in a way. Yes? Uh, about 1.1 uh, or 1.2 micrometers, as it should be, as we know all these potentials very well. The other thing that you can do is, in this, in, in this signal here, we can take more and more photons to later times and determine this G2 um, at zero time um, for a time interval you know, with a variable upper time limit. And then you realize only for a short time, so only if I look at the very first emission in time, we get this suppression, we get a, a, a single photon source with a, a small G2, but then if we integrate the signal for upper time limits larger, let's say, than two, two nanoseconds, we come back to a G2 of one. And that is a direct measurement of the dephasing time. No surprise, really, that's what we did already uh, some years ago. That's the Rydberg polariton, if you want to call it this way, dephasing time due to its motion, due to the motion of the atoms at, um, uh, at, the, at the temperatures we are working. Okay. Good. So what's, uh, what's next then? Well, this is a nice uh, proof of concept, but it's not yet a useful single photon source. This is uh, more technical. And the, for example, the lasers that we are using have a very low repetition rate. Um, the brightness of the single photon source, that means how, many, how often for any pulse sequence do I actually get the uh, photon, it's about 10%, which is okay. But we think we can improve, improve this significantly to above 90%, 95% by going to a different scheme. And uh, uh, I mean, part of this experiment, um, of this experimental setup where we excite here with the, the traditional you know, mod lasers, 780, 795 in rubidium, and then excite here with blue lasers, has to do with the history of the uh, development of the lab. It's not the ideal choice today. So what we would do now is replace these Rydberg transitions, or the lasers there, by fiber amplifiers, where you can get a lot of power these days, uh, and at, at very high repetition rates. I mean, now we, we are aiming at repetition rates of a megahertz or, or more, um, and, um, and if we go to this blue, uh, so-called inverted scheme, um, then what is also uh, helping us is that the wavelength in units of the blockade radius is smaller. Yes? And uh, that sort of uh, optimizes the brightness of the source. I can comment on that if anybody is interested. Of course, what we need to measure is one of the major selling points here, namely that these photons are going to be indistinguishable. That's what we hope, yeah, because rubidium is rubidium, and two, sh two such superatoms should emit the same kind of photons. And so if we bring them together on a, on a beam splitter, we should see that they, that they are indistinguishable. And if we have that high brightness and uh, indistinguishability, then this should be a scalable system. But that's sort of what we need to show now. Okay. Of course, one can do further integration, for example, integrating all these lenses that are still sitting outside and need to be aligned uh, into the glass and so on, but this, these are technological things. But we think that this is an interesting single photon source that's potentially is scalable, and it is compatible with memories, which is important, yes? I mean, uh, it's a rubidium photon. It can be stored in a rubidium vapor. Good, that was that. How am I doing? Half an hour, yeah? I started half an hour. OK, good. So um, let's uh, move on to another uh, subject that came out actually as a spin-off when we did the, uh, these experiments with these vapor cells. Because we learned how to control electric fields, how to make uh, electrodes inside here. You see one of our cells. You see, actually, I don't know where you see it. There are some electrodes above here. Electrodes below here, so you can do Rydberg excitation in a capacitor, between two capacitor plates, basically. If you then put a little amplifier, very low noise, and specially designed <laughs> trans impedance amplifier here, right, very close to the source, then it turns out your Rydberg signal that you used to detect optically 
now can be detected electrically. So you can have an electric readout from such a vapor cell. Okay. How does this look like? Well, if we take our rubidium and we excite it to our Wittberg state, then what happens in a vapor cell, because it's never a perfect vacuum, there's a collision with the background gas and these highly excited uh, atoms just uh, dissociate. And we have an electron and an ion. And these two charges will just move to the capacitor plates and generate the current. So this is the optical signal that I get when I look at the transmission of the cell. That's an EIT signal. And this is the signal that in the same cell with the same integration time is recorded if I record the current. I go back and forth. So you see clearly the signal to noise of this electrical readout technique is, is much better than the optical readout. And initially, you know, we thought, okay, I mean that's interesting, maybe to stabilize our lasers better, you know, because we always need a reference to stabilize Rydberg lasers. But then we were talking to some engineers actually in our uh, university. And you know, initially, I mean Stuttgart is automotive city, yes, and if you these days, talk to people about nitric oxide, for example, coming out of your engine at the back, then <laughs> the German brands don't have the best reputation of controlling this very well, let's say. Yes. Uh, and part of the reason is that there are no very sensitive detectors for trace gases of NO, as in particular NO. Um, so, Oh, actually, I forgot. This is another example of why electrical readout is so much better than optical readout. This is a start map recorded, I think, in five minutes uh, integration time. And that's the same signal in the optical domain. And you see, I mean, that's not theory. That's a measurement here. Yes. Um, so nitric oxide is an interesting molecule. Yes, It has uh, applications uh, in environmental science. I just men mentioned this. But it also has applications in medical science. <coughs> if you think about it, well, I didn't think about this, but I talked to some medical guys at Ulm University, you know, that they are part of our quantum center. They told me, okay, nitric oxide is a very good marker, biomarker, like other small molecules in your me metabolism. Uh, for example, if you have some problem with your cardiovascular function or so, the concentration of NO would change. Uh, the concentration of your in your breath basically would change. So if you would be able to detect NO at the PPB level, that's the required uh, uh, detection limit, then this would be a game changer in the uh, in the non-invasive uh, diagnostic methods that you can Im imagine. Okay. By the way, I I, I had to learn that. One of the interesting things is the fraction of concentrations that you breathe through your nose and your mouth. It's actually a factor of 10. You have more, a factor of 10 more nitric oxide in your breath from the nose than from the mouth. And that's also an indicator for certain diseases on the way you, know, um, you breathe. Anyway, I'm not an expert on this. I know about risk back excitations. Does that make what say that again? <laughs> so if it, it's a biomarker for cardiovascular function, yeah. yes. it's not, it's not, it's the whole cardiovascular system. No, no, this is not responsible for this difference here, yes. Uh, what, what is? is huh? then, this, I, nobody can explain to me what, 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 where does this uh, come from, and that's the current uh, research so topic in their field. So then that, the, the 200 to 2,000 PPB out of the nose, that's like a background then, is, what, is that what you're saying? No, the, the PP, I mean, so if that's the, the normal concentration of a normal patient, right. let's say, it would have 2,000 PPD from the nose and uh, 160 or less um, uh, from, the, from the mouth. Right. And then, when, okay, so then you would have some cardiovascular disease. Do those both go down? Then they, then they would both go down back and up. Fractional. Yes. But there are other diseases, you know, that have to do with uh, whatever. Don't ask me, really. I mean, <laughs> they, they couldn't tell me even the reason why it is so vast and different. Right? But it is clear, you know, that if you have a device that is able to detect NO on the PPB level, um, then this would be a very useful device for such kind of applications. Nitric oxide, for example, if you have an inflammation, it's a very reactive molecule. It, it sort of increases its concentration. But that's as far as I you know, understand this medical side. 
But we went back and looked at our results on rubidium and said, you know, how much PPB, you know, can we uh, detect PPB, let's say, in, in nitrogen, in the background gas, and maybe even at ambient pressures. And then the numbers look promising. And so we went, um, this is one of the cells that we made, and we took it to the lab of Ed Grant, you know, in uh, uh, Vancouver, because he's, uh, at least to my knowledge, one of the pioneers, and he has these lasers available to do the excitation to the Rydberg state. And uh, here it is, that's a Rydberg series of nitric oxide at almost ambient pressures. So, as we know, of course, since the early days of Rydberg spectroscopy, you know, Amalie Segre, the famous papers from 1930s, Rydberg lines survive, you know, even at ambient pressure. So, one of, the idea would be now to sit on one of those Rydberg lines here, and uh, by the way, they are measured again with the electric readout, and this is no, uh, this is very good signal to noise. And, you know, uh, push the limit, basically, by, for example, going to a three photon excitation, using lock in techniques, use CW lasers instead of pulse lasers, that's a pulse experiment, no spectral resolution, really. I mean, and Ed has this place, and we are so glad that he let us use it, but it's a, the, the bandwidth of excitation is, uh, is 100 gigahertz or something like this. It's nothing compared to modern high-resolution spectroscopy. And so we, we said, okay, we should uh, propose a project where we replace this pulse laser with CW lasers and do high-resolution spectroscopy in an NO uh, cell. And that's even uh, hopefully interesting for theorists because if you think about it in ambient pressures, then you have a Rydberg state and polar molecules inside. That should ring a bell. Who said or Robert? Because it's no longer just a boring uh, point-like scatterer. Okay. So that's why I thought, okay, there's an enough basic research on the spectroscopy and maybe some interesting application. And that's what we are going to do now. These uh, cells, basically, we have tested them. There are some advantages. They have a linear response. They are not suffering from uh, fluctuations of light intensity because we can operate them in saturation and so on and so on. Uh, if you have more questions about the technological side, you can ask me about this. Of course, there are many other competing techniques. Uh, this one is particularly selective and also sensitive. Good. So now I have 15 more minutes for the bonus material <laughs> on um, ultra cold atoms. Okay. Um, so, we are going from hot, is this uh, cell still alive somewhere, or, ah, yes, here it is, okay. <laughs> That's the cell. <laughs> Actually, this is a picture of a different cell, but okay. Um, so that's where we did all the experiments with the vapor cells, and now we are going to do experiments in this kind of box with a Bose-Einstein condensate, okay. So we are moving just with an optical, actually with a magnetic transport, a BEC into this box, and you see we have a, a uh, high NA lens in the box, such that we can make very tight focus. And we have, you know, you see these wires and so on, we have electric field control in there, such that we can compensate any stray electric field up to a certain level, as I will discuss now. And then the question is, how about making ions in a quantum gas? And there are uh, famous uh, early pioneering publications by people here in the audience um, proposing to make a molecular ions in the BEC, snowballs. Um, I don't know whether Bladan is here. I mean, they have done the first pioneering experiments to put an ion, or to overlap an ion trap with a cold gas and study the interaction of a trap ion with not a condensate, but a, a, a magneto-optical trap at the time. But by now, this has been done by many groups. Um, and there is a problem. Um, the problem for uh, overlapping a power trap with a Bose-Einstein condensate is micromotion. The ion will just wiggle around and will never be really cold. Okay. Actually, the, the temperatures of this ion in the condensate that has been realized typically is on the order of one millikelvin. Uh, so it's relatively hot on our scales. You actually see that, okay, that is a, is a topic uh, in, in, in superfluids, like liquid helium, there are whole books about it. Um, ITEM has workshops about this problem. Actually, there were two of them in the last uh, two years. 
and it was actually co-funded. You can see our little logo, that one here, co-funded by us. Yes. Um, and people like Johannes Hecker Denschlag and Tommaso Calarco sort of are uh, were the organizers together with Svetlana. So we uh, thought, how can we have a completely different approach to this problem using Ritberg elements? And what we did is we just made a very small condensate in a tightly focused dipole trap and a very large Rydberg atom, such that eventually the electron of the Rydberg atom is most of the time outside the condensate, and what is left behind is the ion in the center. So where does this Rydberg atom come from? Well, we do our typical Rydberg excitations, uh, two-fold excitation, make use of this blockade effect, because all these uh, volumes are much smaller than the blockade volume, that way ensure that any time we do the experiment, there's only a single one. So the Rydberg blockade is just a tool here, basically, to prepare a single quantum system. OK, and then the first uh, thing was, well, if we do our normal spectroscopy, can we see the effect of this ion on the spectroscopy of that Rydberg line um, if we scan the frequency? Now, if you look at the typical two-body interaction potential of a Rydberg state, with ground state atoms, that's a, uh, the trilobite potentials, that basically reflects, on first sight, the electron wave function. And you see the electron wave function wiggles around. Actually, uh, in atomic units, that's in Bohr radii, that reaches out to 70,000. Okay? So that's uh, more or less something like uh, three or four micrometers, I, I believe. And if you, so that's sort of the largest Rydberg atom we can make. And if you compare this with the Thomas Fermi profile of our condensate sitting here, in the order of uh, 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 10,000 um, atomic units, then you see that the electron spends most of the time outside the condensate. Now, why is this important? Uh, from Hussein and Roba and everybody you have learned, hopefully, that the interaction goes like scattering length divided by mass. And the mass of the electron is just 100,000 times smaller than the one of the ion. And therefore, the interaction strength, um, in the scattering length, there's also a mass factor. It's the square root of m. The, the interaction strength of the electron is um, 300 times stronger than the interaction with the ion, just because of this mass difference. That's why we need to get rid of the electron and make it orbit, basically, our condensate. On the other hand, we want to keep it around, we thought, initially, because it will serve as a perfect Faraday cage for this ion. I mean, we excite this uh, Rydberg atom. The temperature of the initial atom is 100 nanokelvin, so it's a very, very cold ion in the end, if you do the experiment right. But if there would be a stray field, you know, it would pull on this ion. There's no trap in our case, no, no power trap. Yeah? It would pull on this ion, and basically it would immediately disappear. That's what we thought. So then, uh, if you do spectroscopy, you uh, basically have to throw in your atoms here in the condensate and sum up the density shift, basically, over with this integral, uh, integrating the, the uh, Thomas Fermi profile with this potential curve. Or in other words, I mean, if you look into a condensate, like our condensate, and you look at the nearest neighbor distribution, again, in atomic units, then you see that for our density, which is actually pretty high, the, uh, the next neighbor from one atom sits at a distance of about less than 1,000 1, atomic units. Okay. And if you plot the potential now, that's the same potential as this one, but uh, scaled it up now, um, with and without the contribution of the ion, the red one is with only for this electron, then you see that the potential of the ion, you know, that's a C4 over R4 potential, becomes significant only at distances below that, uh, uh, let's say below uh, one and a half uh, thousand atomic units, okay? So it will be a single or two or three, so that's a, the next next neighbor, the next next neighbor distribution, it will be the contribution of only a few atoms um, that will actually experience this, but the funny thing is, this is such a large shift here that we can see it uh, spectroscopically. 
So here you see the series of uh, spectra that sort of doing Rydberg spectroscopy in a condensate. And some of you have, um, might remember that we did this for a long time for large condensates. Uh, and you see the typical you know, broadening for low principle quantum number due to the interaction of the electron with the condensate. Very broad lines. Here you see a shift of 150 megahertz um, uh, due to the electron um, ground state interaction. But then if you do this with higher and higher principal quantum number, you basically bring the electron out and this shift goes away. Um, and if you then compare basically um, this uh, spectroscopy line with what you would expect if there would be only the electron, then you see that it is actually broader and more shifted than what you would get from the electron alone. Yeah, so here's the reference. This, this one is the calculation for only the electron. And the measurement shows nice agreement with the calculation where you include the potential of the ion. Okay, so it leads to a little bit of uh, additional redshift due to this potential here and also um, uh, some broadening. So in a way, we see the ion spectroscopically as a shift here, as a contribution to the line shape and the line position. Okay, <clears throat> that was the uh, uh, first attempt basically to look for the effect of the ion. But uh, we moved on actually and uh, thought, well, uh, maybe we should get rid of this electron overall and just make an ion. Uh, because then you can make use of the ion Rydberg blockade. Because of course the ion produces an electric field and that electric field by the polarizability of the Rydberg state, you know, shifts this line even further out of resonance. So the blockade radius of an ion is actually larger than the blockade radius of a Rydberg atom on another Rydberg atom. And that's what is shown here. Here you see the potential. <clears throat> if, a, if an ion sits at the origin uh, for n equals 72 and n equals 100, and you see if you compare it to our bandwidth of excitation, you see that we get blockade radii of uh, 20 or 30 micrometers. And we thought, OK, that's a nice tool. We want to make use of this. How do we make use of this? Well, again, I mean, we have a very small uh, cloud of atoms initially. And in this experiment, we excite an, uh, a single Rydberg atom in the NS state. Um, and then what we do is, so we have the single excitation. We use what we call an inverted Raman scheme to the continuum. This way, we can kick off the electron without applying an electric field. I mean, usually what you would do with a Rydberg atom, you would field ionize it. You would apply an electric field and rip it off, but then this field acts on the ion and the ion shoots off the other side. So you don't want to do this. You, you want to apply two lasers that are just tuned slightly above the continuum. And then as the electron is so light, you know, it takes all the energy and the ion basically remains behind as a cold object. That's important. Another question is, how cold is it? You know, how can you probe this? I mean, it's not trapped. It just sits there. Okay. Um, and of course, in any experiment, you have a stray field, some, some finite electric field. Um, so this ion will move away. It will move out. Yes? Um, it accelerates in this little, very small electric field. So it moves to here. How can we probe this? Well, now we use the ion Rydberg blockade. Because we just sent another Rydberg pulse to the same position where we created the first one. And if the ion stayed around, we will not be able to excite this because there is already an ion sitting there shifting the Rydberg line out of resonance. Okay. So um, that's uh, the, the sequence. So we use uh, the Rydberg atom first as a source of the ion and then as a probe of the ion. That's the signal that you see here, yes? So you see, in a, on a time scale of tens of microseconds, the ion stays around. It, 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 the, the field is good enough, in this case, 1.7 millivolt per centimeter, that, that it doesn't drift um, out of the blockade region, at least. Yes? And then after some time, of course, you get the full Rydberg signal, which means the ion is gone. Okay. So <clears throat> actually, this is, a, this is a very nice experimental technique. I have to advertise it because uh, it, 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 it's a conditional measurement. So we measure this Rydberg signal only when we get the ion. So we have a 70% ionization efficiency and imperfections and so on. But 
we can count them. Okay, and they, they arrive at the uh, at our detector at two different, completely different times. So we can do a conditional measurement. If there is an ion, will there be a Rydberg atom? And that's the signal. Okay. So we can do this more systematically for different uh, principal quantum numbers and deliberately apply an electric field just for a fixed time of light now <clears throat> to measure the blockade radius. I mean, the ion Rydberg blockade radius now. And that's the result. So these are the different principal quantum numbers. You can analyze this and turn this field here with, together with the time of light into a blockade radius. It's a very simple uh, equation. So that's a black line that we would expect. And then the blue points are our measurements. And we were very excited that it works fine. But at high principal quantum number, around 100, there's this little deviation. And it took us some time. But now we understand this is actually due to the electric field that we are using to measure this blockade radius. Because if we apply an electric field on top of the Coulomb potential of the um, ion, it will shift the Rydberg lines a little bit further um, and therefore lead to a deviation and that can be easily in a self-consistent way be calculated and if we do that, I mean the theory fits the experimental uh, data points perfectly. So you might ask, you know, is this uh, good for anything? Well, certainly it is very good to determine your electric spray fields in the chamber. That's sort of maybe an electric, I mean a an experimental physicist's uh, uh, tool now, but it's very important, yes? Uh, here you see we are monitoring the x, y, and z electric field in our little box that I showed you in the beginning over the course of uh, 10, 10 or 12 hours. And you see we have some drift. That's sort of what you always get if you have uh, a complex setup and there are windows and you know there are charges and so on. Um, but the important thing is we can determine this, the error bar of the signal, with this method to a, a level of 100 microvolts per centimeter. And that's much better than our previous method that used the, just the Stark effect itself. Um, so for us, this is our, the first thing uh, that, that come, came to our minds that, well, let's see how good our chamber is. Um, we found out that the, this is a very good electric field probe to make our experimental environment stable. Yeah? How far from the surface are you? Uh, this box has a dimension of centimeters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, but what else can you do? Well, um, how about measuring transport of this ion in a condensate? OK. Uh, so <laughs> you could ask the question, if I apply a voltage here, and I measure uh, the motion of the ion, that is a current. Um, is there an interesting IV curve of a PEC? And we think there is an interesting IV curve, and that's what we are working on, because of snowball effects. Because this single ion in a condensate will not move with its mass, but it will have ground state atoms attached to it. And then if it's a heavy snowball, it will move much slower. and then it will uh, have a different current. So you, in an IV curve over a condensate, where you put some electric field across this, this condensate, you should see some interesting features. There are, of course, other things that are going on, namely Langevin scattering, inelastic processes, conversion of this ion into a complex ion, and so on. But the charge will always remain. And so what we are uh, doing right now in the lab, I can't show you the result, but that's sort of the outlook here is we are trying to measure the IV curve of a quantum gas with this technique. OK, um, that was it. Uh, this was the latest news from, uh, uh, from Stuttgart uh, about our Rydberg uh, atoms. Um, and I should uh, not end without mentioning uh, the heroes here. Um, the red arrows are the PhD students that have contributed to what I just uh, told you. Uh, let's start with Katrin. Um, she did the measurements of the huge Rydberg atom uh, and, and the small condensate and the spectroscopic detection of the ion. She graduated. And what does she do? She goes to Bosch company. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, what actually most of my students do. They either go to Bosch or Mercedes-Benz, something like this, or Porsche, you know, because they 
you go to Porsche, you get a nice car. <laughs> then Ralph Ritter, he's always hiding in the back. Uh, he did all this integrated photonics in his uh, PhD back into a single mode optical fiber. Okay. So this way, we select sort of uh, the, the, the mode uh, in the forward, forward scattering. And then we send it to a APD HIT. So the position moving around, that doesn't No, not at all. It's a medium.
much larger. It's larger than what? Maybe not extremely large, but actually use this so-called Lyot method to increase it. Yeah, so actually, but that's a technical detail. Before we do our three pulses, we have another pulse just to get rid, get rid of all the atoms on the surface and increase the optical thickness this way, actually by a factor of 30. So is it possible to boost it here on the Because yeah, this I mean, so this thing here. Because this thing here. this thing here. this thing here. this thing here. Because this thing here. this thing here. higher uh, density, even mm -hmm. higher density than we are uh, uh, using right now. Uh, because, um, how should I say this? Um, of course, it's a smaller wavelength, and therefore the resonant cross section is smaller. Therefore, I can I go with higher density, and therefore I have more atoms in my blockade, uh, blockaded uh, volume later on. This transition is weaker. This transition. this transition is weaker, exactly. Yes. But uh, this, so this would, will allow us to have many, many more atoms per blockade radius. You know, at the wavelength, and that will increase the sort of the. It is a weaker transition, exactly. Yeah, we can talk about this. This is an interesting point. I mean, you want to increase. I mean, you, you don't want to have an optical thickness larger than three or four because otherwise your single photon that you are producing is already absorbed on the way out. Okay, so. The optical thickness for me is, is like a fixed quantity. And then I want to have so as many atoms. Density, you know, hmm? like the, just optical thickness of unperturbed sample, that's what I'm sorry. Over the blockade. Yeah, but this is, uh, I mean, so for the blockade effect that I'm using here to make a single photon, um, I think, you know, I don't want to have this, this photon that comes here out on a different transition to be reabsorbed in the medium. And therefore, I can't have an optical thickness of a thousand or something like this. It would be it would be absorbed on the way out. And at least if I care about the brightness, which is how often do I really get a single photon out of myself? You don't think so? I mean, that was I mean, that's an important point. Yeah? This was my reasoning. I have a I need to have an optical thickness on the order of one to ten or something like this, and then the brightness of the source will be determined by how many atoms do I get for this kind of uh, optical thickness. And then it's more favorable to use a weaker transition with a smaller wavelength. Think about counter example, for example, our, our experiments with ladder on this yes. big brigade here, where they would work with overall optical thickness, which is like, I don't know, 20, 30, you know, it's much higher. Right? But it's an EIT. Uh, uh, which is very similar. <coughs> yeah, but there's a four-wave mixing. 